Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Wednesday today, for those who are keeping track at home of the days, we're going to be doing chapter number 11 today. Today's chapter is really interesting uh, in that it has a character who ends up becoming a really key character. We're still kind of generally meeting people, uh, but it's someone who ends up becoming a really key part of our main character's lives. So that's pretty exciting. Looking forward to introducing you all to her. Um, today's question for conversation afterward is, tell us about a time you met someone who would end up becoming an important part of your life. Did you know right away that they were going to be someone so important, or was that something that uh, you came to understand after some time? The other thing I wanted to mention to you today, I mentioned this two weeks ago, I've been doing a series of C.S. Lewis articles over at Tor.com, T-O-R. Tor is one of the larger science fiction websites. And today I have an article with them about the voyage of the Dawn Treader, particularly the story of our little mouse hero, Reap a Cheap. So that's, uh, you might check that out. It has a lot to do actually with some of the things we're thinking about and talking about right now in quarantine and with friends who are sick and all those sorts of things. So, well, if you're here, I see a bunch of you are. Go ahead and sound off. Let me know who's in the room today so we can keep track of everybody. Uh, and we'll get started in just a moment here on chapter 11. I know you guys, the way the live stream works, you're like 30 seconds behind me. So sometimes I ask you something and then uh, I don't hear from you for a little bit. Aha, here we go. Scales family is here. Can't wait for more. I'm glad. I'm excited you guys are here. Uh, yeah, it should be fun. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know we went a little long yesterday, so we'll try not to go quite so long today. Jess is here and looking forward to chapter 11. <laughs> uh, when I read that out loud, that sounded different uh, that you were excited about chapter 11. <laughs> Just bankruptcy, you know. Uh, Doug says Reap is the best. He actually is. I think he's the best mouse in all of literature. Uh, and I know some people will fight me on that, but that's what I think. Deborah's here. Hey, Deborah, we missed you yesterday. Glad you're back. Um, okay, let's jump in to chapter 11. And remember, our question for conversation afterwards, uh, you can leave this as a comment uh, while I'm reading if you like, or wait till afterwards is tell us about a time you met someone who'd end up becoming a really important part of your life, a good friend, uh, a spouse, uh, someone who became like a parental figure or a child figure in your life. Um, yeah, tell us about someone like that. And did you know when you first met them that they were gonna become someone quite that important? Uh, just got here, best mouse reap a cheap. Absolutely best mouse reap a cheap, I think. I know you're someone who could actually fight me on pop culture things, so let me know if you disagree. Uh, and uh, Beth is here. She says, hi. And Beth was with us, just not live, which is great. Glad you're back with us live. It's exciting. Okay, let's start. Chapter 11, uh, lessons. We're picking up with Jason again, and uh, here we go. Chapter 11, Lessons. And so the majestic one sent away the Cockery, and they live in the desert to the east, beyond the Tolmine Pass. They build no houses and plant no crops from the ordering of the world in Ellen Hill's story. After the terrifying interview with Breakbones, Jason took a bath. He still couldn't get his left sneaker off, which meant he couldn't get his jeans off, so he took a bath in his jeans with one shoe on. The level of filthiness in the bathroom afterwards couldn't be exaggerated, partly because Jason was fascinated with how the tub magically filled with the correct amount of perfectly hot water. He had a splash war with the tub, seeing if he could empty it before it refilled. The mud on him seemed to cloud into the water, then disappear. So he experimented with slinging the freshly re-moistened muck out of the tub as well. When he was done, he was clean, but the bathroom looked as if a gigantic muddy dog had shaken itself off in the middle of the floor. He sloshed into the room he shared with Kokoa and David. I'm afraid to look at the bathroom, David said, if this is you all cleaned up. Kokoa had a book in his hands, but he dropped it onto his bed, his mouth open wide. Did you bathe in your jeans, brah? 
couldn't get my shoe off, Jason said. Kakoa reached into his waistband and pulled out a small, sharp knife. Come here, then. Jason stepped backward, but David grabbed him and threw him onto the floor. Kakoa shut it, cut his shoelaces, then scooped up both of Jason's shoes, walked into the bathroom, threw them in the toilet basin, and closed the lid. The shoes were gone. Aw, oh, man, Jason said. You don't have to keep messed up stuff like that, David said. We can order up fresh ones. It was time for bed after that. There were three beds, one on each wall, except the one with the door to the hallway. They gave Jason the bed beneath the window so he could, quote, smell the night rain. It wasn't night, though, not really. Even though it was late, there was a sort of dimming, but no true night. Out the window, Jason could see the short wall around their gigantic house, and beyond that, a few scattered buildings, and then the much taller city wall. It wasn't even dark enough to see any stars. Kakoa and David had an evening ritual. They each shared a thing they were thankful for from the day. This surprised Jason. He made a joke about them being so sensitive, and they gave him a lecture about it. A true warrior has to be thankful for the people and places and world they are protecting, Kakoa said. Yeah, David said. You have to respect the land and the people in it. If you don't take the time for gratitude, you miss your everyday blessings. Also, if you don't participate, we will beat you up. It's true, dude. Fine, Jason said. I'm sure I can think of something. But honestly, since what had happened with Jenny, he had struggled to find things to be thankful for. Some of the rawness had begun to pass, but he still couldn't make it through a day without thinking of her. Of course, he had also ditched his entire life to come to the Sunlit Lands with Madeline and had been immediately separated from her. On the other hand, he hadn't been eaten by a mermaid, which was a new category of things to be thankful for. Kakoa said, I'm thankful for the weather today. Clear skies, blue and deep. David said, yeah, man. For me, I'm glad there's a night off from the fighting to welcome our new roomie. Jason didn't say anything for a while, and he could tell they were waiting. I'm glad Breakbones didn't yank his chains out of the wall and kill us, he said finally. They laughed at that for a while. Now one thing we hope for the new day, Kakoa said. But Jason didn't hear those because he was sound asleep. He woke to full bright sunlight streaming through the window. His roommates were already up and dressed. Jason laughed when he saw Jason's eyes flutter open. Breakfast, he said, and slapped a warm bowl of porridge with purple berries into Jason's hands. The porridge was bland and the berries too sour. Then Jason saw the pudding cup sitting on the end of his bed. He scooped the pudding into his porridge and mixed it in, which created a sort of chocolate-flavored, chunky puddle that was somewhere between edible and delicious. Kakoa grabbed the empty pudding container and ran a finger around the inside. What is this, pudding? Yeah, Jason said. My deal with Hanali was a cup of pudding every day for the rest of my life. In exchange, I'd hang out here for a year. He smacked his lips. Magic pudding tastes exactly like hospital pudding. Kakoa and David laughed until Jason grinned too, even though he didn't know what was so funny. I'd love to have seen Honolly's face, David said. Some guy who didn't ask for money or fame or anything. Just a cup of pudding. <laughs> what did you guys get in your deals? Or are we not supposed to tell each other? Ah, oh, that's Poho, man. Everybody knows everybody's business around here, Kakoa said. For me, some Howley stole my family's land. I do my time here, and when I go back, the Ellen will give me back the land. They said they'd take care of the Howley, too. Jason took another bite of his strange breakfast. What does that mean? They'll take care of him. I don't ask. They don't say. Maybe they'll bring him back here. I don't know. Me, I stay till I'm 21, David said. My parents died. Whoa. My mom. My dad, I can't live with him. So when I'm 21, I go home. The Ellen will give me a hundred grand, and I'm on my way. Jason looked at his empty pudding cup. A hundred grand? That's a lot of pudding. Yeah. David said, but I didn't think of that for the rest of my life thing. I should have just said a thousand bucks a day. Kakoa threw Jason a pile of white clothes with a pair of white sneakers on top. Pudding cups, that's a new one around here. There's some real interesting ones, you'll see. Jason got dressed, though he hesitated when he got to the white gloves. You have to wear those, David said. It's an L&L thing. Hands are private, you only show them to people who are close to you. They asked if Jason planned to fight the skim that night, and he said he wanted to go with them at least, see what it was all about. He wasn't sure he wanted to fight. They talked about it while David led them to a long, grassy field where they could practice. We have to get him to a storyteller, though, yeah. They're not going to let him fight tonight if he hasn't heard the story. 
A table the length of a limo had been set out, and on the table there were weapons, bows, scimitars, maces, knives, staffs, and a variety of others, mostly hand-to-hand -hand stuff. No guns or any sort of firearm or explosive. Kakoa sorted through them, setting aside different options he thought Jason might like. Hmm, maybe a mace? Oh, these are cool. This is called a katar. Or, or what about this? What's this one called again, David? Tomfa. Yeah, Tomfa. He held it up to Jason. It looked like a nightstick. Jason picked up a bow. He didn't want to stab or smash anyone, and if he did get involved in the fight that evening, he'd rather be as far away from it as possible. Kakoa pointed out a hay bale with a target draped on it. Jason grabbed an arrow and tried to put it up against the bow, but he kept fumbling and dropping it. The fifth time it fell off the drawstring, he drew. He threw the bow on the ground. Why do the LNL want inexperienced teenage fighters again? Kakoa and David burst out laughing. David showed him a smooth oval on the bow near the grip. Put your bracelet tattoo right next to that, he said. A warm sensation traveled through the lattice of Jason's tattoo. He picked up the arrow, expertly knocked it, found himself standing in the proper position, and straightened one arm, the fletching of the arrow now near his ear. He corrected slightly for the wind, loosed the string, and watched the arrow fly. It thunked comfortably into the outer edge of the target, not a bullseye, but a moment before he hadn't even been able to get the arrow onto the bow. Jason looked at his hands in wonder. A thrill of adrenaline went through him. It felt like that perfect moment when you're an expert and everything is going right and you're on top of your game. It came so naturally, so easily. How? Magic, bra. We don't learn how to fight. We learn how to channel the magic. It takes an afternoon to become the best fighter ever. David juggled an axe and two knives, spinning them easily over his head. The Elenil loan us their fighting skills. Most of them are hundreds of years old. So it's their skills, but we do the fighting. Jason frowned. Our bodies, our risk. Nah, Kakoa said. You get wounded, they, fit, they fix you with, your, with magic. Just don't get killed dead. Can't do anything about that, but lose an arm or get a crushed rib cage, boom. They'll fix you right up. That's not cool, man, David said, bringing up the arm thing. Kakoa laughed and handed Jason another arrow. One of the black skulls cut David's arm off a couple weeks ago. Should have seen him running for the wall with one arm, the black skulls chasing him. Pretty hilarious. David gave him a fake sarcastic laugh. Yeah, hilarious. It would have killed me if not for Shula. Black skulls? Jason had the bow up again, the arrow knocked and ready to loose. A minor adjustment to his fingering and the arrow sailed to the target, lodging a bit closer to the center this time. Amazing. He felt a swell of pride at his skill at how easy it was to launch an arrow into the target from this distance. Kakoa picked up a bow, held his tattoo against it, and started firing arrows. Three shots, three bullseyes. They're like the best skim fighters. Pretty creepy looking, too. There's three of them. They wear long white robes and black painted animal skulls over their faces. Nothing hurts them. They're not like us, where they need to go somewhere to heal. It's like an arrow to the heart doesn't do anything other than slow them down. They're dead already, David said. I'm telling you, they're dead. They don't even bleed. Stupid, Kakoa said. There's no such thing as zombies. Man, you don't know. You're shooting magic arrows for a war between monsters and legends and angels. How do you know there aren't zombies? Kakoa put a hand on Jason's bow and pushed it toward the ground. Okay. Quick tutorial. The oval on the bow, that's a magical receptor. Think of it like a permission slip. Some LNL has given the bow permission to borrow their skill. While you have it, they don't. It's like your tattoo, David said. It's the permission slip that tells the magic you're allowed to be in the sunlit lands and allows your pudding to be delivered in the morning. So, Jason said slowly, I'm stealing someone else's skills to do this. Kakoa shook his head emphatically. They've given permission, remember? But when you aim, you reach out through the magic and take the skill. Some of it's coming through without trying, but you have to. Kakoa struggled to find the right words, finally ending with, you have to reach for it. It's like a waterway, David said. You have to open it all the way to get the full skill. You're leaving some of the skill with the owner. You're taking enough magic that there are two mediocre archers right now instead of one terrible one and one amazing one. Does it? Does it bother them when I take their archery skills? They don't even know unless they're trying to use those skills at the same moment. Jason took a deep breath. Okay, he could do this. 
He concentrated on the archery skills he would need. Balance, steady hands, clear vision, the smooth movement of the drawstring, the careful release. A confidence came over him, the sort of confidence you feel when you've done something a million times, and it's not even that it's easy, it's automatic. When he opened his eyes, his silver tattoo was shining with a white light. Look at how much magic is flowing through, David said. Good job. Shoot an arrow. The arrow fell effortlessly into place, and raising the bow was like taking a breath. Jason could see the precise place he wanted the arrow to go, could feel himself correcting for the breeze and the distance, and when he released, the arrow flew in a graceful arc, beautiful and perfect, and dead into the center of the target. He raised his bow in the air and let out an enormous whoop of joy, and he and David and Kakoa danced and jumped around, shouting and cheering. You almost sound proud, as if you've done something worthwhile, said a voice, low and skeptical. They stopped celebrating. Kakoa made a face. Hey, by Leia, David said. She was a full head taller than Jason and wore loose-fitting cream pants tied at her waist with a red sash. Her blouse was also loose, but a deep blue color like clear water, billowing out wide at the sleeves, then tapering to a tight cuff on her wrists. Her smooth skin was the tan color of sunbaked sand. Her hair was pulled back, but flowed as easily as her clothing a dark brown wave moving around her face and past her shoulders. The color of her hair was echoed in a spray of freckles across her cheekbones, but her eyes were easily the most striking thing about her. Jason had never seen eyes that color. They seemed almost to emanate a pale silver light. He couldn't look away. If not for the eyes, he would have almost thought she was human. He reached out to shake hands. I'm Jason, he said. She held his gaze as if waiting for something, but he didn't know what. She turned to his roommates. Have you taught him nothing? David shrugged. He can shoot a bow. We did cut him out of his shoes, Kokoa said helpfully. By lay aside. In the sunlit lands, especially among the L and L, to touch bare hands is a great intimacy. It's deeply offensive to offer such a thing when announcing one's name. It is wise to keep your hands covered, and in most cases, to keep them out of sight altogether. I'm not Alan L, though, Jason said. Neither are you. Her eyes sparkled. Or maybe it's just that they were glowing. Jason couldn't tell. It is a compliment that you notice, she said. I'm of the Cockery people, beyond the Tolmine Pass. My mother is called Willow, and my grandmother Abronia. I've come to make my fortune and fight the skim. David flopped down on the grass. She fights the old-fashioned way, her own skill, no magic, and she keeps her wounds. Bailea nodded curtly, which is why I come here to my practice area, a practice area I assume you are finished with as you're taking the hard-earned skills and abilities of others rather than honing your own. Yeah, yeah, Kakoa said. We're done. He paused. Hey, Bailea. We're supposed to take Jason to a storyteller to get the whole why we fight the skim story. Any chance you'd want to tell him? Tell him yourself, Bailea said, studying the weapons in front of her. She picked up a medium-sized hatchet. Can't be a human telling the story, David said. You know the rules. Has to be a citizen of the Sunlit Lands. Bailea gave him a sour look. I came to make a fortune, not spend it. What does that mean? Jason asked. Kakoa laughed. The Cockery... Don't use money. They use stories. It's their only currency. So when she says she came here to make her fortune, it's like she came here to live some adventures or learn stories their community doesn't have. David rearranged the weapons on the table, putting everything he and his roommates had messed around with back in their places. Please, by Leia. We'll have to hike into the city center and find a storyteller then come all the way back before dusk and then fight. We'll be exhausted. Bailea shook her head, then looked at the far-off target, hefting the hatchet. With a sinewy grace, she stretched back with her entire body, then, strang then sprang forward like an Olympian throwing a javelin. The hatchet flew in a high arc, its spinning blade catching the sunlight over and over. It descended to the target and buried itself deep into the center, shattering the arrows there and sending up a plume of hay. Jason dropped his bow. Whoa. Bailea smiled at him. You fight for the Elenil and against the skim. That is all the story you need to know. She looked him over carefully. If you wish to exchange stories another time, 
I will consider it. You look to be from a different clan than other humans I've spoken to. Without another word, she turned, marched toward the target, yanked out her hatchet and what remained of the arrows. Jason just stared. David picked up Jason's bow and put it away, and Kakoa grabbed his arm and pulled him backward until he started to walk half in a daze. She's amazing, Jason said. I don't know if that counted as you hearing the story, David said. I hope we don't get in trouble at roll call. Kakoa said, Jason didn't even agree to fight in his contract with the Alan Hill. He can do what he wants. She's so amazing, Jason said. Kakoa answered, you heard the bit about not waving bare hands at the Alan Hill, right? Did you see that axe throwing thing? Jason asked. No handshakes, David said, and no high fives, Kakoa said. Super insulting. How did she even throw the axe that far? Jason turned back to look, but David grabbed him and pulled him toward the house. She'll be at the wall tonight, David said. Let's eat lunch. Jason's feet skimmed along the ground. She'll be there tonight. She's amazing, he said. Kakoa snickered. First girl he sees who's good with a hatchet. He's head over heels. David didn't laugh. Don't tell by Leia. She'll want you to fight on the front lines with her. Kakoa threw his arms around both of their shoulders. Not tonight, though, because tonight the three musketeers fight again. Dude, the war party, David said. Jason had a sudden worrisome thought that pulled him out of his reverie of Bilea. What had happened to the previous third of their three musketeers? Where, where was Kakoa and David's previous roommate? Don't get beheaded, they kept saying to him. Gulp. Maybe he wouldn't be riding out to battle with them tonight after all. The end of chapter 11. There we go. Tomorrow, chapter 12, our last reading of the week will be chapter 12 where uh, uh, Madeline will finally hear the story of why they fight. Okay, here's a couple things. This is important. Reaper Cheap is the best mouse. We needed to know that for sure. Hi from Texas. The Sims are here. Hello, Sims. And yes, cutting Jason out of those shoes was pretty important. Okay, so today's question for afterwards, Jason doesn't know it yet, but he just met someone who's going to be very key in his future, which is by Leia. So today's question for conversation, tell us about a time you met someone who'd end up becoming an important part of your life. Did you know right away you'd be close or not? And while you're thinking about that and typing it up, just a reminder, Friday, my good friend Henry Lien is going to be joining us. Henry is uh, quite a guy. He is the author of Peace Sprout Chen, Future Legend of Skate and Sword. We were texting this morning about Friday because I had forgotten to get back to him about an email. And uh, I, I said, Henry, I'm so excited to have you on and he wrote back he like exclamation point we're gonna have so much fun it's gonna be amazing he's a very high energy guy he's very excited and uh, as i've mentioned he's gonna be singing one of his original songs he's written songs he's sung with adina Men menzel he he uh does drums and traditional chinese instruments and i assume he'll have to choose between them but yeah he'll be with us doing those things uh and of course as always don't forget, Tyndale.com is taking orders and selling books right now. Uh, you can also get the Crescent Stone audiobook, uh, which is narrated by Natasha Sudek uh, at oasisaudio.com. And of course, when you like, comment, or subscribe at facebook.com slash Michelotus Books or youtube.com slash Matt Michelotus Books, it is a great favor to me and it helps people find us here to come hang out with us. Okay, looks like we got a couple comments here. My daughter Zoe says, Bye, Leia is the best. And it is hard to disagree. She's certainly one of my favorites. And she only gets better as she goes along. Uh, in fact, I'm writing book three right now, and Bye, Leia has not yet made an appearance, and I'm starting to feel it. So hopefully she will soon. Okay, here's a story uh, from Beth, Dr. Awesome. Dr. Awesome is married, by the way, to Mr. Awesome. So let's see what she has to say. My first task as a ministry intern was to email students a reminder about the leadership retreat. Some punk senior I'd never heard of wrote back and said he wouldn't be in town. I sternly reminded him that he'd made a commitment and he changed his flight to be here. And that is how I met Mr. Awesome. <laughs> 
<laughs> Amazing. That's such a good story. He actually had, okay, I lost the, for some reason on my, on my thing here, I can't see the ends of longer comments. Uh, he changed his flight to be there. That is amazing. Good, good. Uh, and I assume that you guys then saw each other afterwards and it was love at first sight, probably. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not sure if we have any more coming. Feel free to leave them in the comments. Uh, and we can interact there. I'm going to go ahead. We're at 25 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and call it for the day. Be sure to join us tomorrow as Madeline goes and hears from the Ellenil. Well, actually not from the Ellenil. We'll see that tomorrow, though. The story of why the skim must be opposed by all who live in the sunlit lands. Uh, yeah, it's it's quite a story. So we'll hear that tomorrow. And then on Friday, Henry Leanne. So my friends, as always, be safe. And I will see you tomorrow. Have a great day.